<笑>リヴァイスクワードおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおお
That's see, I, I was asking that. How come? Oh shit. Yes, Kenny. This guy's a madman. I love it. <笑>そう、そう、クリーピー。この中だな。今日そう、クリーピー。この中だな。今日そう、クリーピー。この中だな。今日そう、クリーピー。この中だな。今日そう、クリーピー。この中だな。今日そう、クリーピー。この中だな
that was some that was such an entertaining episode man holy shit <laughs> oh man i've seen three amazing episodes back to back five six seven oh my god that episode so licking it i guess you don't see i was under the impression that you need the full dose i guess not he licked it and he's turning but is it going to give him the complete transformation is he going to turn into like a full on like titan or um also is there more of it in that bag historia took the bag so i'm guessing she took it because she she knows there's more in there all right man so first of all another incredible episode like uh, they're just knocking him out of the park here uh back to back um, yeah, it just, you know, every episode keeps just raising the stakes. Um, and, you know, the impressive thing is that, um, they're able to fit in so much into, like, 20 minutes, uh, or maybe even 19, because, you know, a lot of it, um, I've noticed it's, like, a 24-minute, like, runtime, 24, 23, but at least, like, three, four minutes of that is, like, the intro or, like, the outro, um... But yeah, you know, I think it's quite impressive that they can fit in that much. Um, and, you know, it doesn't feel like it's rushed. It just doesn't. Um, uh, you know, they, they had action in this. They had a lot of exposition. Uh, it was like the perfect mesh. That final scene of Historia, you know, taking it into her own hands. Uh, oh my god, such a, such a beautiful scene, man. I absolutely love that. And um, the score or the song that plays in the background as she... Uh, you know, makes that choice, um, the you know, a big choice. I'll get into it a little bit later. I think it's one of the, the biggest character moments of the season, uh, perhaps even the series. But, you know, the, the, the track that plays in the background, oh my God, just amazing. Uh, it's It's got to be one of my new favorites. Uh, the incredible score continues to have such a major impact. You know, it continues to elevate these scenes. Um... Uh, again, in the same manner Ramin Javadi's music does for Game of Thrones, you know, so I really put it at that level. Okay, let's go to the actual final shot of the episode. And the final shot is quite um, insane, actually, because Rod Rice is in the process of turning into a titan. Uh, and from the looks of it, a freakishly large titan, you know, that last shot of the spine forming and, like, taking out the columns. Yeah, this thing... Uh, you know, it feels like I'm about to see another Colossal Titan, um, and I, you know, I'm not sure um, this cave uh, can hold uh, that this kind of Titan. Now, that being said, I do have some questions. Um, now, it's clear that he is turning into a Titan, um, but, you know, it appears that licking the serum um, is enough for a transformation. Now, the question is, is it enough for a complete transformation? Now, surely just licking the serum uh, can't be enough for complete transformation, right? Because if it is, then it defeats the purpose of, um, you know, getting the full dose, right? Um, but again, you know, I say that, but I have to remember that this isn't just another person, right? This is someone of royal blood. So perhaps, you know, um, perhaps he can... Um, turn into the intended titan just by licking it um let's see let's see how it plays out because and you know the next question becomes is he going to be a mindless titan or an intelligent titan uh maybe that could be the difference right uh since he didn't actually get um injective of the full dose maybe he ends up being a mindless titan now you know i ask that because uh you know the the shot of frida turning into a titan uh, for the first time. Now that didn't look like just a mere um, mindless titan. It actually looked like Annie's titan. Um, the body at least. And just, I don't know, like uh, the demeanor. It just didn't feel like a mindless titan's demeanor. Um, now if you compare uh, Aaron's titan, um, clearly a mindless titan, um, to Frida's titan, you know, there's quite the difference there. Now, Rod did say earlier in the episode that this serum is going to turn her into a powerful titan. So it is possible that, you know, maybe this serum is a bit more potent, right? And you mix that, uh, you know, with the 
uh, royal blood, and you end up getting uh, a different kind of titan, a powerful titan. You know, it's definitely not a mindless titan. Uh, if you look, look again, if you look back at Frida's titan, um, as she's getting ready to, you know, take it from her uncle. So, yeah, you know, let's, let's see how it all plays out. My guess is that I don't think he's going to end up being intelligent. Um, because he just, he just licked it, you know, it's just, I don't think he got enough of the dose, um, enough to initiate the transformation, but I don't think it's going to be enough to, um, get him, uh, get him to, like, the intended Titan. Now, let's stay on Rod for a second. Um, he's quite interesting, actually. Now, you have to remember that, um, there's two portions to, to a reaction. Um... The reaction itself, um, you know, that's the first initial take on something, you know, instant. Um, so yes, you know, I was annoyed uh, a few times uh, by some of the answers Rod was given uh, Historia. But then, you know, this, uh, this, this portion of it, the analysis portion, it really allows you to calm down, right? And, you know, I've seen enough of the show now. Um, and I've seen enough of Isayama's writing now to know that, you know, none of these characters are just simply good or evil, right? Because at the end of the day, it, it became quite clear that Rod himself doesn't know much, right? Um, and I actually uh, felt quite sad um, at the end there. Um, you know that shot of him crawling up to the serum? Um... And it appears that his spine has been fractured. You know, Historia kind of, you know, tossed him. And uh, it appears that um, I, uh, she hurt him. And, oh, actually, you know, um, is that going to play into um, the transformation? Uh, uh, I think if it was a full dose, I don't think um, that injury is going to play a part. But again, you know, he just licked a little bit of it. So, again, uh, excited to see how this transformation turns out. But, you know, going back to my uh, initial point, seeing him, uh, uh, you know, crawl up to the serum, uh, that was actually a really sad moment. You know, I, I felt pity for him at that moment. And he ends up doing the one thing he's avoided this whole time. Uh, you know, the one thing he's terrified of. Um, uh, basically, the last resort, right? Um, duty kind of pushed him to the last resort. Because if he doesn't turn into a titan, you know, then everything... Uh, his ancestors did, um, or, you know, Frida, his father, um, or, um, his brother, you know, all of them, that was all for nothing, right? So, basically, you know, he's absolutely, like, terrified of this, and, you know, this episode made it clear that, you know, he, he does not, he simply does not want this, um, titan shifting ability or like he doesn't want to take on the the founding titan now again i think there are other reasons for that um i'm gonna get into it i have a i have a bit of an exciting thought uh, and i think this episode kind of solidified that thought and i'll get into that now rod's mindset um you know i i, I do find it fascinating because i think the major turning point um in all of this uh in his mindset was the point he saw his own brother. Now, this is someone who had the exact same stance as him. Uh, you know, they both stood side by side, and they begged their father to, you know, to change the situation, to help humanity, to get rid of the Titans. He saw that individual, um, someone who was just like him, he saw that individual completely change uh, the moment um, he got the founding Titan. I feel like that's the major turning point here. Because he saw firsthand that um, that someone just like him, um, uh, you know, changed their mind. And I think at that point, after seeing that change in his brother, he decided that this this is you know the best course of action for humanity. And he decided that he cannot even begin to you know comprehend what they've become after taking this uh, founding titan. He cannot. Uh, comprehend the knowledge they possess, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, he called them omnipotent, right? So gods, um, uh, kami. Uh, so yeah, he decided that his role is to fall in line and devote himself to these uh, omnipotent beings, right? As they, you know, as they rule humanity um, 
or look over humanity, you know, within the walls, uh, their domain, their bubble. And, you know, that takes me back to Sonis again. Um, you know, the, after after seeing this, you know, his his um, thought process is beginning to make even more sense. It's clear that he was also kind of like Rod, you know, because he completely uh, felt that he was right in doing um, the things he did, you know, uh, for the cause, for the king's peace. And that also takes me uh, to Armin at that table talking to the Levi squad as Sunnis is getting tortured down below, downstairs. You know, he told them that, you know, the only reason, you know, we're fighting these people is because they happen to belong to a different group, you know, a different ideology. And, you know, I felt that the tone Armin took there is of, you know, uh, you know, who, who knows who's right and who's wrong. You know, they just happen to belong to a different group. And this is what they believe in. Uh, people like Sunnis. And now you see Rod. This is what he believes in. At the end of the day, uh, the point is... Rod Rice has just as much information as the scouts. Nothing. He doesn't know anything. Like truly, he doesn't actually truly know anything about the world, right? So they're kind of in the same position. Now, that being said, you know, let's not forget that Rod Rice is, uh, you know, he's not a good person. Um, you know, he's a scumbag. He just is. And, you know, I'm not, right now I'm not talking about like good or evil. That's a big topic. You know, that's, you know, put that to the side. I'm just talking about him as a person he is a scumbag you know he's had people killed so yes you know in terms of personality in terms of you know morals um yeah yes he's a scumbag but in the bigger picture you know good versus evil i'm not too sure if i'm able you know if i'm able to say that he's just like a downright evil person um you know i think there's a, a really interesting um dynamic here actually uh it takes me back to that carriage uh, Zachary and um, Commander Smith. That whole scene was about selfish desires, right? Um, and one of the major talking points that came out of that is the fact that both of them prioritize themselves and their goals uh, over that of uh, humanity. And, you know, he decided to prioritize learning the truth, um, you know, because it's his dream to validate his late father. And, you know, he even hears from Pixis in the last episode, right? Uh, Pixis like made it clear that you know he, this you know I'm not like you man, um, and Pixis it's clear to Pixis that you know uh, the commander you know Commander Smith has other priorities right now interestingly Rod Rice ended up doing quite the opposite of that. You know he gave up on learning the truth you know uh, or the pursuit of this um, elusive truth, uh, and he decided to prioritize uh, what's best for humanity. Again you have to you know. Yes, he, he might be a twisted person, um, he might be a scumbag, but it appears that, you know, he does believe that this is best for humanity, right? Now, one, you know, one of them happens to be part of this courageous scout regiment, you know, at the center of it all, right? These heroes. And the other happens to be this person from a nefarious, um, shadowy royal bloodline, uh, royal family, right? So, you know, food for thought, you know, uh, great stuff. Um, gray areas, moral ambiguities, you know, so sometimes you kind of have to step back and look at it neutrally, you know. Um, uh, you know, yes, all of us love the scouts, all of us love Commander Smith, you know. Um, those are the heroes of the show, kind of, right? Not, again, uh, I say heroes are heroes, at least, you know, because those are the people uh, the audience is kind of following, you know. Um, but, you know, it is interesting that, you know, the other guy, the other guy who who seems to be the scumbag is actually doing what he thinks is best for humanity, right? And that he doesn't prioritize himself or learning the truth. Uh, and Commander Smith does. So, you know, really, really interesting stuff there. Now, by the end of the episode, Historia did end up, you know, making a game-changing decision, right? But at one point, she was fully committed to the idea of bringing the Founding Titan and all of its amazing uh, capabilities, abilities, back into the royal bloodline. And, you know, she firmly believed that, you know, by doing this, she she would have a good chance of exterminating the Titans. Um, now, all of us know that was not going to happen, right? Because uh, once someone inherits this founding titan you know they end up being controlled 
Now, um, the point I'm trying to make is that um, it's starting to sound familiar, right? Especially to Aaron. Uh, you know, at that point, his demeanor completely changes, you know, upon hearing that. You know, upon hearing that Historia intends to exterminate the Titans, uh, as long as she's able to bring back the Founding Titan, right, into the Royal Bloodline. Uh, essentially, there is an interesting role reversal that happens here. Their motivations kind of switch. Um, and, you know, and at that moment, uh, Aaron comes to a harsh, uh, no, devastating realization that his existence is in direct conflict with his um, uh, ultimate goal. And in that moment, he believes that, you know, him dying is the best solution. Right? Him dying is the best um, chance for humanity at this point. Um, and, you know, again, you know, there's feelings of immense guilt. Uh, and at this point, you know, he, he felt that perhaps, you know, he could atone for the sins of his father. Again, this is, you know, at this point in time, he believes that his father took away, you know, that chance from humanity. And, and of course, you know, there's all that death. Um, that came before this moment, you know, all those people that died protecting Aaron, um, believing in that cause, believing in Aaron as a hope of humanity, right? Again, all that pressure on his shoulders. And, you know, this is quite the opposite of how Aaron usually carries himself. You know, this is a broken individual at this point. You know, seeing Aaron like that, uh, that was heartbreaking. It brought me to tears. Um, just imagine, man, imagine thinking that you and your father are the reason for all this death um, around you, the choice your father made, and then um, you being made the hope of humanity, but, you know, still there's so much death around you. Uh, and then, of course, it's, the, you know, the Rod Rice angle, you know, he's just kind of like, um, he's kind of, uh, you know, adding gas to the fire. Um, and at this point, he's fully convinced Aaron as well that, you know, yes, you know, uh, it's your father's fault, and, you know, you are the reason that, you um, the founding titan has been lost uh for the time being at least and you know seeing aaron like this you know seeing him broken down and ready to die at this point brought back uh feelings she struggled with um herself you know uh she saw that you know he's now going through everything she was going through at one point you know you know the notion that you know you're not needed that you're in hindrance you know it's better off if you're dead and i think all that hit home she she knows exactly how that feels you know and i and you know that ended up giving us one of the like i said earlier one of the best character moments of the season of the series you know she she rejected all of it you know she 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 she's fed up she rejected all of it took matters into her own hands of course a little bit of help from our best girl ymir great little uh you know uh flash uh, in her mind um uh, of her reminding Historia to, you know, live a life that you are proud of. Um, and, yeah, man, it, again, it, a great moment uh, in the series. Not even though, you know, it was heartbreaking and sad to see Aaron like that. I thought it was actually great in terms of character uh, progression and development. Um, you know, because up until this point, Aaron's just been this, you know, um, like I said before, you know, attack first, think later, you know, just like a typical hero right um but this kind of adds another dimension uh to him you know i like that that he's able to go through this that he can break down so at the end of the day uh the coordinate uh the founding titan is exactly in the right place in terms of story progression because you know aaron having it or grisha having it before aaron uh it broke uh, you know, that 100-year cycle of uh, the, the race family having it. And, you know, of course, it's been clear at this point that, you know, as long as it was in the royal bloodline, they were not able to really do much um, about it. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of story progression, it's in the exact uh, right place at this point in time. And, you know, Aaron having it, uh, it changes things, right? Because, uh, again, you know, like I said in the last episode... They've shown us already that yes, he can, he can make use of it, right? He can tap into it. Um, uh, 
in some cases, of course. You know, it's a rare situation. Now, like I said earlier, there's a lot of good exposition in this episode. Uh, you know, Rod gave us a bit of a history lesson, right? So the cave itself was built a um, hundred years ago, right? Um, the walls were made a hundred years ago. Uh, you know, back in uh, episode one of the series, Hunnis said that, you know, there hasn't been an attack for a hundred years, right? Uh, Rod also mentioned that um, uh, that the founding titan itself has been passed down from generation to generation for a hundred years, right? So that, that seems to be the sweet spot. That seems to be the beginning of this cycle. But see, one thing has me a little bit confused now. You know, all this talk of, you know, passing the titan down from generation to generation and the way Rod kind of set it up is that, you know, it's a singular transfer, right? His father had it, then his brother had it, then his daughter had it, uh, then Grisha took it, then Aaron has it. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the official transfer, you know, it, it's it's been shown that it's single, you know, it's a single transfer. But, you know, Maria Rose and Sinna, in that, you know, um, end credits, they're... You know, they're doing it together, all three of them together. Now, does that mean that all three of them are getting, um, you know, are all three of them getting the founding titan in some capacity? Is it being like split up in three parts? Um, again, that is all assuming that they are also going through the same ritual at that point. And at what point did, you know, it turn into a singular transfer, right? Um, if indeed that is them uh going through the founding titan uh, uh you know uh ritual i think that's something interesting right there i think that's something to keep an eye out on uh eye out for now another really you know crazy thing to remember here is that the the walls themselves are made up of titans massive titans you know um colossal titans um and hundreds of you know hundreds of thousands of them uh maybe even millions i'm not entirely sure if it's in the millions or hundreds of it's definitely in hundreds of thousand thousands um it could potentially be millions as well you know it totally could be um that's just insane you know how how exactly did that happen uh, the process uh you know the founding titan uh has amazing capabilities because i just don't think that many people are just going to volunteer for this you know um I think it's exceedingly unlikely that they all just, you know, made the choice to be in there. Are they in a comatose state? Um, um, the, you know, they showed me one of them uh, at the end of season one in the post credit scene, you know. Uh, and then once again in season two, episode one. And at that point, that one titan actually moves its eye, right? Meaning it, there is some activity there, right? There is some activity there. And then, of course, Pastor Nick... You know, he, he was scared shitless uh, of sunlight getting to them or to that one titan. So again, it remains to be seen if they're all in a prolonged comatose state. Um, but again, a terrifying possibility here. Imagine even if a small percentage of them get out, right? Just a small percentage. Uh, that is, that that would just be insane, right? And, you know, say say a small percentage gets out something happens and they end up you know coming out uh like you know are they are they you know made in the image of the the first king you know are they pacifist titans are they just going to be there to be controlled um you know now going back to fa um father pastor nick and his reaction to all of that you know um the fear he showed um, at the possibility of some like getting to uh, the one that was uh, exposed, that tells me you know it's gonna be bad bad news if those um, titans get out. Um, and you know again, the thing to remember here is they're like all colossal titans, right? Um, whew, uh, crazy shit, man. And also, um, it's interesting to note that you know Reiner and Bertolt they knew they had intel about this. They knew about this. You know they made sure to target the gates. In their initial, you know, attack, um, um, and you know the follow through attack, uh, Reiner's follow through attack on the on the the gates, you know. So they they knew, so you know their people know about this, you know, and they do not want to fuck with it, you know. They they don't want that heat, <laughs> right? So you know that's another really 
um, uh, fascinating uh, thing here that, you know, they know all about this. They know the walls are made up of these titans and they don't want to, you know, mess with any of that. Again, you know, all of these signs kind of are pointing to something apocalyptic if, you know, even a small percentage of them get out. Now, let's stick to um, Reiner Bertold, uh, the warrior crew, basically. Um, you know, it's been clear for some time now. They have they have knowledge, more knowledge than Aaron and his, you know, friends and uh, just the people inside, right? So it was clear, even in season one, you know, in the forest of the giant trees, uh, even Ymir has much more knowledge than most of them. You know, they were trying to tippy-toe around Aaron, uh, you know, as they spoke about the things that are going on out there. You know, now their mission has been to retrieve this coordinate, uh, the screen, a uh, founding titan. Um, but they, you know, they know it as a coordinate. Now, you know, it's been clear that, you know, their mission, part of their mission is to bring it back to their hometown, you know, back to, you know, outside the walls. So, you know, it, it's clear that they're not trying to destroy it. You know, they're trying to bring it back to their side. You know, so that in itself is such an exciting prospect because now it's been established to use it. You need someone of royal blood, you know, race blood um, from the royal bloodline. Um, so does that mean they have a rogue race family member on their side, right? That, that'd be fucking exciting, man. Um, you know, because... It, it, if they are trying to bring it back to their side, you know, it's kind of useless to them if they don't have someone of royal blood. The problem here is the fact that the moment someone from the race bloodline um, inherits the founding titan, they end up changing their stance, right? You know, they end up kind of being useless almost in terms of, um, uh, you know, of getting rid of the titans. But again, you have to remember, the goals are different. The goals, you know, they're, the, you know, Reiner and Bertolt's people might not care about that, you know. Maybe that's exactly what they want. They don't want the Titans to, um, um, you know, to be exterminated. Or is it possible that they have something figured out, you know, because, you know, it's it, it's been established that it, it is possible to make use of it, even as a non-race. You know, Aaron used it uh, after he made contact. You know, with the Smiling Titan. Um, is it possible that their side has something else figured out? Now, I'll come back to, you know, Reiner Bird told the Warrior crew a little bit later. Um, but let's, you know, let's talk about the serum and uh, the spinal fluid. Now, you know, for the first time, I got, you know, some much needed, you know, clarification on this serum. Essentially, it's made up of spinal fluid. Now, it has been clarified if it's extracted from... Uh, you know, a mindless titan, like a base titan, or a titan shifter. You know, I used to speculate that, you know, back in season one, that Grisha might be the one who's kind of experimenting and, you know, manufacturing this. But, you know, I think that's <laughs> highly unlikely. But I do know one thing. It appears that Rod had a limited supply, uh, you know, given his reaction to Historia smashing one of them. Um... So, you know, again, there there are, you know, they clarified a few things, but there are a few more questions, uh, you know, in true Attack on Titan fashion, right? Um, did, you know, did the, the Royal Bloodline have um, a limited supply for those 100 years? So they had to, you know, um, really make full use of it, you know, uh, make sure you're making the right choices. But, but then again... You know, um, that, that's just the race, you know, bloodline. How about the people that injected Ymir? <laughs> they injected, like, who knows how many. That could have been, like, um, if they ended up injecting everyone they found in that, you know, cult, uh, right? That, that could have been, like, 20, 30, perhaps, you know, 40 people in there that they injected. You know, so they, you know, those people from that place... Um, they seem to have quite the supply, right, of this uh, serum that, that's made up of spinal fluid. So, yeah, um, they, they certainly know how to make it, or, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a problem. You know, it's not in low supply. If they can just, you know, use it on that many people just to, you know, curse them, you know, to basically that was their, you know, that was their sentence. Uh, you know, uh, Titan for life, mindless Titan for life. But there has been a special case of transformations. Going back to season two, the Beast Titan, right? 
it was, you know, halfway through season two, it was kind of, you know, clear that these are his titans. Like, he initiated the change. I remember I used to call him the bringer of titans, <laughs> right? So that's interesting here, right? Because I still believe it's, you know, so unlikely that, you know, he's lining them up and, you know, uh, injecting them one by one, like, as if, you know, they're just going to stand there, you know? And, you know, I speculated that he's um, he's exposing them to this serum. Now, I know it's it's spinal fluid, made up of spinal fluid. He's exposing them to, um, uh, you know, this group of people um, uh, somehow. And, you know, I do feel like it probably is something unique uh, to the Beast Titan, you know, a special ability, much like, you know, Reiner having, you know, um, the Armored Titan and then... Uh, Bertolt having, you know, the Colossal Titan. They all have their own sets of abilities that are unique to them. So, you know, this could be un this could be something that's unique just to the Beast Titan. And, you know, I'm still not, you know, I'm not able to really think up of how he does it. You know, how he uh, <laughs> initiates the change, but he does it. That much is clear. There's been a lingering thought I've had since, you know, season one, early season one. And I still do. But I feel like this episode kind of allowed me to put something together. Um, now, you know, I've asked the question uh, many times now throughout the series. Um, how come Grisha couldn't just inject himself? How come Grisha couldn't do the things he wants Aaron to do? Um, right? That's been a bit of a, bit of a mystery. Um, you know, and did he realize that the crazy amount of pressure he's going to put on his uh, only child? Right. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, now I know he was at that point in time, he was a Titan himself anyways. And he had the founding Titan and, you know, he passed it on to Aaron. So I have a bit of an answer to that. I think there is more to it, though. Right. And this season, I've asked the same question of Rod Rice. You know, how come he can't just inject himself? How come he needs Historia so bad? You know, and I just, I assume that, of course, there's got to be a reason for this. And this episode kind of, you know, it does tell me a lot of those reasons, you know. Uh, essentially, he's terrified of it. He's a coward. He doesn't want to become um, a titan himself. Though he did end up ingesting, you know, the serum and becoming uh, the, the one thing he was uh, most terrified of. Uh, but again, just like Grisha, I think there's more to it. And, you know, going back to Grisha, I don't think he's a coward. You know, uh, you could clearly tell he's devastated about this choice he has to make. But what if there's a whole new, a totally different layer of devastation in there? What if he had no choice but to pass it on to Aaron? What if he was not able to hold on to it much longer? Then let me jump back to Rod Race and um, um, the royal uh, bloodline, the Race family. You know... The whole concept of passing it down from generation to generation, right? That brings me to the next point. Uh, uh, this is uh, a substantial point, I think, in this uh, theory I'm trying to, you know, uh, construct here. The fact that so many of these Titan Shifters are kids, or they became Titan Shifters uh, as kids. In this episode, they confirmed that Frida uh, inherited... The, the founding titan at 15. 15. Reiner, Bertolt, Annie, um, Marcel. They were all kids. They were titan shifters as kids. Um, you know, uh, the, the opening to this season, you know, they show us all four of them stumbling, you know, through the forest. At that point, they are titan shifters. Right? And then, of course, is Aaron. He also became a titan shifter as a kid. And, you know, it's just... I, it's one of the main reasons I simply cannot bring myself to hate them. Uh, I just don't know enough about them. I need to, uh, I need to see their backstories. And you know, how do you judge kids? How do you? I think you have to hold the people that sent them accountable for their actions. Um, you know, for putting this kind of thing on children and turning them into child soldiers and sending them in. I think there is a specific reason that all of them are getting these abilities, these titan-shifting abilities as kids. I, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence. Now, how do you go about grounding this seemingly OP titan-shifting ability? Because let's be honest, it is kind of OP, right, to have these abilities. 
uh, to be a Titan Shifter. I think you do that by introducing a ticking time bomb plot device. And I think it's been executed to perfection. Uh, essentially, I'm trying to say there's a catch. There's got to be a catch. And I think that catch is that you can only hold the Titan Shifting ability for a limited amount of time. And, you know, uh, that's the reason Grisha had to pass it on to Eren. And, you know, that's the thing I was talking about. You know, another layer of devastation here that he's basically putting this on his only child, uh, knowing that, you know, he can only hold it for a limited amount of time himself. And, you know, I think that's the reason the royal family passes it down from generation to generation to young adults and their uh, families, you know. And uh, in this episode, it was confirmed that Frida got it at 15. And again, they also showed a young um, Rod Race um, and his brother, you know. Uh, and his brother got it. And it, it was clear that he was also a young adult himself. Uh, you know, 14, 15, probably. Same age as Frida. Let's use a quick example from another anime. The Devil Fruit from One Piece. Uh, there's certainly a catch there, right? Of course, you know, you can have these amazing, almost OP abilities. But again, there is a catch. I think the exact same thing is happening here. There's a ticking time bomb plot device in place. And I think that there is a catch to having the titan shifting abilities and you know i just use one piece as an example but you know there's so many examples of this you know the ticking time bomb uh plot device in books in films in games um and it really it really spices things up um and you know it just just adds a whole new level of intrigue now you know now the really interesting thing here is you know thinking about the possibilities you know what exactly happens you know you know what are the consequences if an individual does not pass on the titan shifting abilities right um do, you know is your body not able to handle it at a certain age or after a certain age you know hence you know giving it to younger kids um uh giving giving it to them at a younger age so they can make use of it perhaps um, for that limited amount of time, um, and, you know, you know, what happens if a person dies, you know, does it just get lost forever, is it just gone, could this be similar to Solid Snake and his accelerated aging, um, you know, maybe that's the reason they have to give it to young children, you know, I can't say I've seen any evidence of that so far, but, you know, it's exciting to really, you know, speculate about this, uh, yeah, and that, you know, that just opens up, uh, all kinds of, you know, problems now, because, uh, does that mean um, at some point, you know, Aaron, he's going to have to pass it on? Or you know, not just Aaron, all of the other time shifters. That is probably the best place to end it off. Um, though there are a few things I kind of you know, didn't really get to talk about. You know, um, of course, there's some great action in this episode. You know, the Battle Royale, the Scouts and Kenny's uh, crew. Uh, you know, Mikasa and Levi doing their thing. You know, the inner strength, uh, you know, popping out again. Um, just, you know, the whole Viva squad, uh, they, this time they didn't hesitate, right? This time they, they got it done. Um, it was quite exciting, you know, uh, the track that was playing in the background, uh, this time it had lyrics. Um, I liked it. Uh, Hanji, I don't think, I don't think they killed her off, but you know, she, she seems to be, um, down for the moment. Oh, and I have to talk about Kenny real quick. Uh, you know, I really do like Kenny, and I hope he, you know, makes it out of there, and then I hope, I just, I just hope he, you know, makes it out of there. His true intentions came to light, you know, basically his plan was to hijack the Founding Titan for himself. Though he was a little bit heartbroken to find out, that, you know, it, he's, it's not going to happen, because, he, you know, even if he eats a Titan and eats Eren, it's not going to transfer to him. And you can see in that one moment, he was kind of heartbroken about this. You know, how come he wants this? Uh, for himself, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of reasons for wanting something something like that, right? Uh, you know, again, uh, Rod Rice uh, describes it as uh, you know being omnipotent, right? Uh, gods among men. But like, how does Kenny even know about this? That's the intriguing thing here. Uh, you know, it appears that he had some kind of connection to um, Rod's brother. He got offended as Rod said something about him. Um, so, you know, going forward, I hope I get to find out a little bit more about Kenny. Um, uh, yet a lot of great moments in this episode. 
all right, that's about it. Uh, that was really enjoyable. As I said earlier, um, during the episode, you know, I absolutely love this show. I adore this show, uh, this anime. So, um, you know, really excited to keep going forward and um, seeing how it all plays out. All right, so thanks for checking that out. Take it easy.